Hello, my name is Ken. I was diagnosed with central retinal vein occlusion in 2002. I'm not a doctor and I have no medical training, so remember to consult your physician without delay when making medical decisions. In this video, we'll take a look at a condition called neovascularization that sometimes develops in more severe cases of central retinal vein occlusion. We'll also examine two conditions that may develop as a result of neovascularization, neovascular glaucoma and vitreous hemorrhage. Neovascularization, when it occurs after a central retinal vein occlusion, is the development of tiny abnormal blood vessels inside the eye. Sometimes these blood vessels are a problem because they grow in the wrong places and get in the way. At other times, these fragile vessels are a problem because they bleed. And finally, their formation can, at times, lead to pulling forces that disturb the normal structures of the eye. So why do these vessels form? Normally, when tissues in the body become starved for oxygen, those tissues release chemicals which encourage the development of new blood vessels. One of the most important of these chemicals is a protein called vascular endothelial growth factor, abbreviated VEGF, and pronounced VEGF. These chemicals stimulate the sprouting and growth of new blood vessels from existing nearby blood vessels and these new blood vessels bring an alternative source of blood to the oxygen needy tissue. This normal process is called angiogenesis. After a central retinal vein occlusion, areas of the retina that are deprived of oxygen because of the blockage in the central retinal vein are thought to release this same protein, VEGF. But in the eye, some of the vessels that form in response to this protein are the fragile, leaky neovascular vessels. A primary tool for combating neovascularization has been a laser treatment called panretinal photocoagulation. In this treatment, a large number of laser scars are created in the peripheral areas of the retina. These laser scars are thought to reduce the production of chemicals like VEGF, which encourage the development of neovascular vessels. This next slide is a representation of how the scars are arranged on the back wall of the eye. These arrangements are located away from the areas of the retina responsible for central vision. As you might expect, peripheral vision may be noticeably reduced after this procedure. More recently, anti-VEGF agents are also being used to combat the development of neovascular vessels. These drugs are discussed in a separate video entitled, What are Anti-VEGF Agents? Currently, these drugs are administered by intravitreal injection, which is an injection directly into the vitreous, this is explained in the video, What is an Intravitreal Injection? One of the most serious eye complications that may follow the development of neovascularization is a condition called neovascular glaucoma. Neovascular glaucoma is characterized by higher than normal pressure within the eye, which can be very painful as well as damaging to vision. To see how this pressure develops, let's take a look at an illustration of the front of the eye. The front part of the eye is filled with a clear, water-like fluid called the aqueous fluid, which delivers nutrients to structures at the front of the eye. This fluid is found in the anterior chamber of the eye, shown here in yellow, the space between the iris and the cornea, and also in what is called the posterior chamber, shown here in orange, the space behind the iris but in front of the vitreous. In a normal eye, this fluid is produced and then circulates around from behind the iris. Most of the fluid exits the eye through a spongy, filter-like structure called the trabecular meshwork. This meshwork is located in an area called the angle, highlighted here in yellow, where the cornea and iris come together. Once through the meshwork, the fluid travels through tiny channels and is eventually taken into the venous blood vessels of the eye. If for some reason the fluid is prevented from exiting the eye, the internal pressure of the eye increases. As pressure within the eye increases, blood is kept from freely flowing in the optic disc. Over time, the optic nerve loses tissue mass, resulting in an optic disc whose profile has a deeper than normal cup-like shape. This damage to the optic disc may result in reduced vision. Neovascular glaucoma develops when abnormal blood vessels form on structures at the front of the eye, causing the interruption of fluid outflow from the eye. 
In this close-up of the area called the angle, you can see the trabecular meshwork down near the tip of the angle. Fluid outflow may be interrupted as neovascular growth clogs up the meshwork. Neovascular glaucoma that occurs when the angle is in its natural shape, as shown here, is said to be in its open angle stage. Over time, however, the fibrous growth that accompanies neovascular vessels may begin to contract, causing the iris and the cornea to be drawn together permanently, blocking the aqueous fluid from reaching the meshwork. This advanced stage of neovascular glaucoma is said to be the angle closure stage. The primary treatments for neovascular glaucoma include the strategies mentioned earlier in this video aimed at stopping the spread of or getting rid of the neovascular vessels. Those are panretinal photocoagulation and the administration of anti-VEGF agents. A number of medicines, both eye drops and oral medications, are available to treat pain, inflammation, and internal eye pressure. One surgical option may be the placement of a glaucoma shunt, also known as an aqueous shunt, tube, or drainage device. A glaucoma shunt is a tube which acts as an artificial passageway for fluid to exit the eye. Typically, a small tube is inserted into the anterior chamber of the eye. Aqueous fluid flows through the tube to a disseminating reservoir, which is sutured to the top outside wall of the eye. The tube and the reservoir are covered from sight by the conjunctiva. Another option is the surgical creation of a small flap through which the aqueous fluid may slowly exit the eye. This type of procedure is known as a trabeculectomy or glaucoma filtering surgery. When other options fail, a procedure called cyclophotocoagulation may be helpful. In this procedure, a laser is used to damage the structure inside the eye where the aqueous fluid is produced. The idea is to reduce the production of fluid but not to the point where the eye loses too much internal pressure. These are just a few of the possible treatments, but if left untreated or if the treatments are ultimately unsuccessful, the condition may progress to the point where surgical removal of the eye is warranted. Another complication that may develop after the formation of neovascular blood vessels is a condition called vitreous hemorrhage. You may recall that the vitreous, shown here in yellow, is the clear jelly-like substance found in the central cavity of the eye. When bleeding occurs into the vitreous, this bleeding is called vitreous hemorrhage. It's very possible that a vitreous hemorrhage is caused by a retinal hemorrhage, where the bleeding makes its way from the inside of the retina out into the vitreous, especially early in the course of central retinal vein occlusion. But later in the course of central retinal vein occlusion, the vitreous hemorrhage is more likely caused by the development of neovascular blood vessels originating from the back inside surface of the eye, from the optic disc or from the retina. The visual effect of bleeding in the vitreous varies widely. Severe vitreous hemorrhages may suddenly block almost all incoming light from properly reaching the retina. In milder vitreous hemorrhages, floaters may be the prominent problem. Floaters are often described as dark spots, strings, or spider webs that float in and out of the visual path. A reddish tint to color perception may also be noticed with vitreous hemorrhages. Vitreous hemorrhages may clear on their own over time. Floaters may gradually drift down out of central vision, and blood may be reabsorbed. But the process is quite slow. Complete clearing can take months after the bleeding is stopped. Alternatively, vitreous hemorrhages may be cleared surgically using a procedure called a vitrectomy. During a vitrectomy, small instruments are passed into the eye through the white of the eye. These instruments are used to remove blood and vitreous while at the same time infusing a replacement saline solution. To sum up then, neovascularization is the development of abnormal leaky vessels inside the eye. This primarily is a problem dealt with by those who have a more severe form of central retinal vein occlusion. Your doctor may schedule frequent follow-up visits for the first several months after an occlusion so that any problems with neovascularization can be caught early and treated promptly.